Good evening, I'm Peter Mansbridge, and this is The National. A nursing home killer sentenced to life as her brief apology falls on deaf ears. It'll never be over for me because my father was murdered. Donald Trump's travel ban gets partial approval. The new conditions are ripe for confusion. Widespread support for a Blue Jay who was too anxious to play. Plus, Bob McDonald takes your science questions, like why can't we see the very hottest stars? They live fast and die young. <laughs> Only so, the good ones do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How do you speak to the unspeakable to explain the pain left by the murder of a beloved senior? Today, the families of eight nursing home patients told a court in Woodstock, Ontario, how they were affected by the crimes of Elizabeth Wetlaufer. And then, the former nurse was sentenced. The CBC's John Lancaster was in the courtroom. Elizabeth Wetlaufer is going to prison for life, likely never to be paroled, according to the judge who sentenced her today. In court, the families of her victims tearfully recounted the horrors the former nurse inflicted on them. It's overwhelming to listen to the, the people that are left behind and the people who made decisions to put their loved ones into care, including me. Wetlaufer showed no emotion in return. I looked at her in the eyes multiple times, in her dead, cold eyes multiple times when I was speaking and when I was calling her a murderer and she didn't even blink. The 50-year-old former nurse murdered eight elderly or sick patients, all of them at long-term care facilities she worked at in southwestern Ontario. She harmed or tried to kill six more. When she killed my grandmother, she went on a cruise the next day. That's right on her vacation and had fun and took pictures and laughed and she has emotions. She doesn't have to fake them. She just doesn't have emotion when it comes to deciding whose life that she's going to take. In court, Wetlaufer spoke briefly. I have caused tremendous pain, suffering and death. I am extremely sorry. For some, the apology wasn't enough. I will never accept her apology and there's no such thing as closure in this. A lot of people said, oh, it's over. So it's not over. It'll never be over for me because my father was murdered. The killings went undetected for almost a decade. Authorities had no idea until she decided to confess. We started going downhill after these. In her tape statement to police, she said she'd been fueled by rage at her patients. She described as troublesome. For others, she said it was simply their time to go. Every time I walked in after somebody passed away, I always wondered if this day I'm going to get caught. Mm -hmm. Today, Justice Bruce Thomas said Wetlaufer was far from an angel of mercy. Indeed, she was the shadow of death. Ontario's College of Nurses knew there were problems with Wetlaufer. In one case, her license was restricted. In a second, she was fired for harming a patient, yet she was still allowed to practice. Today, the province called or a public inquiry. John Lancaster, CBC News, Woodstock, Ontario. Manitoba's Sakine First Nation was home to six Indigenous women who were murdered or are still missing. Their cases all remain unsolved. That's already the highest number anywhere in Canada. Now, families of other women are speaking to CBC, adding more names to that list. Jill Kubra has some of their stories tonight. Russell Daniels lives in Seguin on the shores of the Winnipeg River, where his sister died 42 years ago. I was so close to my sister. That was my best friend. It was June 1975. His sister Marilyn was 17 and pregnant. Daniels helped sneak her out of the family's home to meet her boyfriend. That was the last time I saw her. The next day, Marilyn's body was pulled from the water. The autopsy revealed she drowned in a boating accident. It made no mention of marks or bruises. But Daniels and family members have long believed Marilyn was murdered after someone on the boat offered a different story. The guy told us that her boyfriend hit her with a paddle on the forehead. Because when she was laying in her casket, she had a blue forehead there. 
Despite pleas to ban constables and RCMP, there was no criminal investigation. In the years following Marilyn's death, her boyfriend was convicted of two different murders. Daniels wants RCMP to look at the case more closely. I hope I can get justice for her. For my sister. Across the river in Seguin, 73-year-old Norman Guimon longs for answers too. His sister, Linda Rose Guimon, a mother of three, was living in Winnipeg in the mid-80s when she disappeared. Not knowing where she is and her last moments, I think about that all the time. Relatives reported her missing, but police in Manitoba have no record of her case. Over the last four decades, the community of just 4,000 people has lost at least 15 Indigenous women and girls. Guimont says it has to stop. I think they're not doing enough, you know. The police and the agencies that are involved. CBC News has now documented 12 unsolved and unresolved cases of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls from Saguin First Nation. Community members are now pushing for a monument to honour their loved ones as they wait for justice. Jill Kubra, CBC News, Winnipeg. Jill has spoken to more families from the Seguin First Nation with missing or murdered relatives. She's documented their stories at cbc.ca slash stolen sisters. Well, it prompted angry protest around the world, scathing editorials and accusations of racism. But tonight, U.S. officials are being forced to figure out how they'll enforce Donald Trump's travel ban. That's because the U.S. Supreme Court ruled today that the ban against certain people from six mostly Muslim countries could be put in place by week's end, at least in part, until it hears the full case on the matter in the fall. Paul Hunter now on what that means and the concerns already being raised. For the White House today, vindication at least for now. How do you feel about the Supreme Court ruling today, Mr. President? Very good, thank you. Today's unanimous Supreme Court decision said the president is a clear victory for our national security. Refugees are welcome here. Recall back in January when the 90-day so-called travel ban first went into effect. It brought chaos at airports around the country as travelers and authorities struggled with new rules blocking travel to the U.S for people from a handful of mostly Muslim countries. Said the White House, the countries are terror prone and the ban is needed while visitor screening steps are studied and toughened up. But Trump initially described the ban on religious terms. A total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. That's big stuff. And signing it into law was one of his first steps as president. America is a nation of immigrants. But protests throughout the country by those angry the U.S. seemed to be closing its doors to those in need led to court challenges and the ban was overturned with courts calling it religious discrimination and an overstep of presidential authority. Today, a temporary reinstatement by the U.S. Supreme Court in agreeing to hear full arguments on the ban in October. But the court altered Trump's directive slightly. It will indeed now apply to travelers from those countries blocking them from the U.S., except for those with what's deemed a bona fide relationship with America, such as close family or a business. Bottom line, it's a win for Trump, who'd long predicted the ban would ultimately hold up, even though critics underline, despite the reinstatement of this tweaked version, the real legal debate is yet to come. It still doesn't deal with this fundamental flaw in the Trump order, which is that at its heart, it is a Muslim ban. Neither does it fully specify what exactly constitutes a relationship with America. Who gets allowed in? Who doesn't? Questions that may well now lead to chaos in airports and in U.S. courts all over again. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. There's more bad news for softwood lumber producers in Canada. The United States announced today how much it will additionally tax imports from this country. Exporters will be forced to pay total duty rates of as much as 31 percent. That includes the tariffs imposed back in April. The U.S. accuses Canada of dumping softwood, selling it for less than fair value. 
Before announcing the additional duties today, the U.S. announced it believes Atlantic Canadian producers should be exempt from the tariffs. Coming up, mystery in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Why are so many whales suddenly dying? You can love a stranger just by looking them in the eye. Plus, Saskatoon kids spend their school year with the elderly. It gave me a reason to get up in the morning. Alternative medicine is a growing industry in Canada with so-called natural remedies taking up a considerable percentage of shelf space at pharmacies. But today, a warning from the traditional medicine camp. A new paper in the Canadian Medical Association Journal warns that natural health products could do more harm than good and that the feds need to step in. Vicodopia explains. Take a walk down the coffin cold aisle and natural remedies often inhabit the same shelves as pharmaceuticals such as Benadryl and Advil, even though those natural products aren't tested with the same scientific rigor as over-the-counter drugs. That's why an editorial in the CMAJ says alternative medicine should be moved to an alternative shelf. What I am concerned about is the average person who is just looking for a cold remedy or something to help their kid who's coughing and they can't tell the difference between a real drug and something that has nothing behind it and they're being deceived and, you know, potentially harmed without their knowledge. Health Canada only started approving these products over the past decade and Stanbrook says that's just added to consumer confusion because the assumption is they must work when the science says otherwise but natural health practitioners defend the process. I find that the article actually is not reflective of the current regulatory environment for natural health products in Canada. They are quite robust and in actual fact are looked to by the WHO, Australia and New Zealand as being gold standard. Not anymore. A recent review for the Australian government calls for a ban on some natural products from being sold in pharmacies because choosing these treatments over conventional medicine could put people at risk. At this store, the pharmacist has no problems with selling natural treatments, though he keeps them on shelves separate from over-the-counter drugs. I do agree. It's, uh, you, do, you do not want to mix those with uh, non-prescription drug or pharmaceutical non-prescription drugs. There are no specific restrictions on how stores should sell natural health products. Health Canada says retail rules are up to provinces. Still, the agency says when there is a problem with natural products, under the current legislation, it's powerless to act. Health Canada has powers now to recall a bag of chips, but does not have the power to recall an unsafe natural health product or cosmetics, so we need to change that. And Health Canada is now considering new rules for the natural products industry, one which would call for the same level of scientific rigor as for pharmaceutical companies. But critics warn certain natural products deemed low risk could be exempt from those rules giving them a free pass. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. Roberto Osuna knows stress. The Blue Jays frequently rely on the 22-year-old to close out games for the win. But over the weekend, Osuna told the team and fans that he couldn't pitch because he's battling anxiety. Christine Birak has more. Roberto Osuna will pitch here in the bottom of the ninth inning. A day after telling the world he feels anxious and lost, 22-year-old Roberto Osuna stepped onto the mound and did what he does best. Outside. Here's a 3-2 with two outs. Got him! Osuna spent most of the weekend in the dugout. In a surprising admission, he said the problem wasn't physical but mental, saying out on the field he feels great. The youngest player in Major League history to reach 75 saves. But off the field, he said, he doesn't feel like himself. Osuna spoke to reporters after last night's game through a translator. It's away from the field that you feel anxious. How have you been feeling over the last 24 hours away from the field? <laughs> it's slowly getting better, but, but I'm getting better. It's unclear whether Osuna has been diagnosed with a specific mental illness, but so far, fans are supporting him. Sport is one of the last places where there's a greater need for awareness around mental health. 
Experts say athletes have the same struggles and issues we all have, but the players are often treated by teams and fans alike as a commodity. So we treat them as though they were property. We talk about trading and the skills that they have and whether we can uh, trade for a better player. And, and these, these kinds of discussions really dehumanize. Former NHL goalie Clint Malarchuk has felt it firsthand. Battling mental illness for decades, he says playing the game was easy. Life off the ice was hard. It was like I couldn't turn my brain off. And it started to affect my sleep. I couldn't sleep at night. And, and it was just ruminating over and over and over. It was like a hamster. He says Osuna made the best possible play. Telling people you need help is the only way out. Osuna said, I wish I knew how to get out of this. But to be honest, I just don't know. A new generation breaking new barriers. For some, it's already a win. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. The curtain has been raised on the next act of BC's political drama. MLAs were back in the legislature today for another round of debate on last week's throne speech. But the opposition just wants to get on with the non-confidence vote. I move, notwithstanding the provision of Standing Order 45A1, to seek unanimous consent to move directly to a vote on the address and reply to let this House demonstrate whether or not the government has its confidence. A confidence motion was introduced, but there was no immediate vote. That requires unanimous consent of the members. The vote will likely be on Thursday, and Christy Clark's Liberals are not expected to survive it. British Prime Minister Theresa May got her deal. The Democratic Unionist Party has signed an agreement to prop up her minority government. Negotiators from both sides made it official this morning. May now has the parliamentary numbers to pass a budget and broker the UK's exit from the European Union. In exchange for the DUP's support, May agreed to increase spending in Northern Ireland. Critics fear the deal could jeopardize the Good Friday peace agreement by favoring pro-British unionists. Straight ahead, a female Canadian soldier makes history at Buckingham Palace. There are times when unconfirmed reports can start to play out in what's happening in front of you and on the screen. Um, and that's, that's when you get trapped a little bit, because if the story is starting to be dictated by unconfirmed reports, in the telling of the story, you've got, you, you, you've got to try and bring the audience along on this. I, I remember you know, the attacks in, in Ottawa on Parliament Hill a couple of years ago. Uh, there was a point at which, I believe it was either the Ottawa Police or the RCMP, uh, put out the word that there, there was something going on at, you know, at the Rideau Centre, which is a kind of shopping mall across the street from Parliament Hill. Uh, I think it was the Ottawa police. And it, this was based on unconfirmed reports. But here was the police on the police radio saying, they didn't say, they said there's somebody there. Uh, and so it became, this then became part of the reason why there was a lot of discussion around that day about whether there was more than one, uh, one person with guns. So, you know, you could ignore this or you can go with it because it is impacting what's happening in front of you. And so I think most, most people went with it to some, to some level. Uh, we had Rosie Barton was right across the street, kind of trapped in, inside the Shadow Laurier in the lobby, trying to, to, to do live reports on, on what was happening from her vantage point. And so she tried to deal with all the aspects of, of, of that particular angle as well. But the basic fact is, as Paul says, on days like that, when there's a breaking story, lots of stuff is wrong, especially at the beginning. You can have two eyewitnesses, good people, honest people, who aren't trying to spin anything, could be standing next to each other and recall events very differently. The number of shots, the number of people, all these things. And you're confronted with this kind of dilemma of trying to, to break it down. So what you're always trying to do is be as transparent as possible about the information you do have, weed out what you don't believe or haven't been able to double or triple or, or more than that source sometimes. 
uh, but sometimes it, it, it can, uh, it can be pretty hard. Canadian in London is hardly an unusual sight, but one Canadian got a lot of attention outside Buckingham Palace today. She was guarding the Queen, something her British female counterparts aren't even allowed to do. Adrian Arsenault explains why. Lest there be any doubt the artillery band warming up near Buckingham Palace is Canadian, then let this soak in a bit. Hockey Night in Canada nostalgia setting the tone. A small place. It's more fuss than she'd like, but the focus is squarely on Captain Megan Couteau of the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry. Everyone's very supportive and everyone's gone through it multiple times. We practiced for hours and hours, so I think we're ready. <laughs> That they and she are, Couteau becoming the first female infantry officer to be the captain of the Queen's Guard. You mark shoulder! Mark. Bit hard to believe she's the first. The ceremony has been happening at Buckingham Palace for 180 years. And even as it was underway, the British military was debating whether she really is the first. Other women have taken part, but no British female infantry officers because there aren't any. Why not? Well, it seems that for a long time, the Brits relied on research suggesting that when it comes to women, there were issues of psychological health, physical strength, and reproductive health. In other words, they really didn't think the women could handle it. I think it's outdated and a little bit silly. Women are frail flowers. <laughs> not Canadian Not women. actually, no. not Canadian women. <laughs> Women have performing frontline infantry roles in Canada since before Couteau was born. She could have told the Brits long ago their worries were misplaced. Um, I think I count it kind of as a blessing sort of that in Canada it's, it's not really a, a huge deal. But for us it's kind of just the way that the Canadians roll. At 24 she's already stacking up honours including commanding a guard at the 100th anniversary of Vimy Ridge. Pictures she'll likely save along with the congratulatory tweets of this day one from the royal family alongside those from her proud dad. The novelty of this may wear off as the Brits are poised to allow women into close combat roles by 2018. That is the real change this flurry of formality signaled, heralded in with a hint of Michael Bublé. That's just what happens when Canadians get a taste of being in charge. Adrian Arsenault, CBC News, London. The company that made the cladding on that London building that went up in flames says it will stop selling the product. Since the fire that killed 79, 60 other high-rises across Britain have been tested for fire safety. All have failed. It's believed the insulation panels on the Grenfell Tower caused the fire to spread so quickly. Testing of cladding was extended today to British schools and hospitals. Intense wildfires are burning in California and Utah. This one was sparked by a car crash on a nearby highway. It quickly grew to almost three square kilometers. The Utah fire started after someone used to a torch to burn weeds. High winds and hot temperatures fanned the flames. More than 1,500 people were forced to flee their homes. Scientists are baffled and worried about a grim phenomenon in Atlantic Canada. At least six endangered North Atlantic right whales have been found dead, floating in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, all in the past three weeks, all without any indication of how or why. And as Sarah Levitt explains, losing even six could deal a harsh blow to the species' survival. It's not a sign marine biologists ever want to see. On June 6, a fisherman spotted a dead North Atlantic right whale about 60 kilometers off the coast of the Magdalen Islands. An upsetting discovery, but no immediate cause for alarm. But now, weeks later, five more whales have been found dead. This is very much a concern. 
Uh, this species is, is one of the most endangered large whales. Um, the latest estimates is approximately 525 individuals. So we're already looking at six lost whales, um, all over 1% of the population. Known for its docility and high blubber content, the right whale was nearly brought to extinction as a result of whale hunting centuries ago. Since then, with conservation status, the species has been slowly recovering. The whales, normally found in the Bay of Fundy in the summertime, have moved north in recent years to the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Now with the deaths, the goal is to retrieve the massive bodies before they decompose in the waters and drift out to sea. It's a monumental task in the sense of having to bring that huge 50 to 60 ton animal ashore, which takes a long time and has to go very slowly for safety reasons. Perhaps most troubling of all, there was no visible signs of what caused the deaths. Well, for us, it very much is we have to really get a good look at these animals, both outside and inside, to be able to figure out you know, what might be the cause. It's urgent now to figure out how these whales died before more suffer the same fate. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. Coming up, what it's like to survive a near-death experience. He has no recollection of the event. He has no going to the light experience. Bob McDonald describes a close call for a close relative. Loneliness is killing our seniors. This is a way to combat loneliness. Plus, everybody wins when school kids mix with the elderly. A rapidly increasing number of experts and politicians are becoming progressively alarmed about air pollution. Most of the damage is caused by car pollution coming from the exhaust, and a bill has just been introduced in the Congress for a federal study of electric cars. The car uses no gas or oil, needs almost no maintenance, and creates no pollution or noise. Speed is a problem, though, for the car can only get up to 40 or 50 miles an hour. It doesn't look like much, but under its homemade plywood body is an efficient zinc-air battery-powered electric motor. In its present experimental form, the car has a top speed of 73 miles per hour and a cruising range of more than 300 miles. It takes eight hours to recharge the battery from an ordinary household electrical outlet. The owner is 61-year-old Bill Ward. I asked him if he's had any approaches from manufacturers. Not genuine approaches, no. General Motors says it has made a breakthrough in the development of batteries to power the electric car of the future. Zinc nickel oxide batteries drive the car for 160 kilometers before they need recharging. That's twice as far as conventional battery power. The motorist simply plugs his car in overnight to build the power back up again. This type of electric car gets a top speed of 80 kilometers an hour and would cost about the same as a standard subcompact model. It may look like an ordinary Chrysler van on the outside, but it's a very different van on the inside. It uses an electrically powered sodium sulfur battery. The electric van was unveiled last week at Expo in Vancouver. Powerplex calculates that electricity for its battery costs about one and a half cents a kilometer, compared to five and a half cents for gasoline. It's becoming almost a ritual in the automotive industry now. A car company puts on a big PR show for its new electric car. Everyone says how wonderful electric cars are, and then they tell you that you can't buy one even if you wanted to, because it just doesn't make economic sense. Experts say improvements in technology will eventually make electric cars practical, but it's slow going, just like Vancouver traffic. There's gold fever on the streets of St. Paul. Everyone's talking about Briex, a small Calgary mining company that struck gold half a world away. And even though the mines are in Indonesia, a lot of the wealth is right here in St. Paul. So do you know any new millionaires? A few. Traders at the Alberta Stock Exchange say they've never seen anything like it. From a low of $1.90 to a high of $170 in just one year. Just five weeks ago, Briex's exploration chief predicted the mine could yield up to 200 million ounces of gold. But last week, the first signs of potential trouble. Briex geologist Michael de Guzman fell from a helicopter on a flight to the mining site. Some say it was suicide. 
Now the Indonesian government has put the project on hold after BRIEX revealed yesterday the size of the find may have been overstated. Wholesale panic today over the BRIEX affair. Canadians dumped the gold company's stock as fast as they could. Share prices crashed and BRIEX struggled in vain to stop the damage. All this after word the company's supposedly gigantic gold strike could be worthless. Security guards have been patrolling the building since early last night when the company released the independent audit by Strathcona Minerals, calling BRIEX the largest fraud in international mining history. BRIEX employees continued to work even as the world speculated about how such a massive salting scheme could have been carried out. The Wall Street Journal ran a front page story talking about a secret storage site where workers added mysterious powders to already crushed rock before sending it on to the assay labs. These are pictures of that alleged site. The sign says, if you have no business here, go away. Around 400 million in market capitalization has been lost in the first four minutes of trading. That money's gone. Well, like millions of Canadian children, a grade six class in Saskatoon is good and ready for summer. But when the students at Sherbrooke Community Centre say goodbye to their friends, that will include 69-year-old Jody and 97-year-old Inga. They all participate in a program known as iGen. It's a one-of-a-kind classroom that brings together the young and the old for lessons in the beauty of life at any age. Here's Bonnie Allen. Good morning to everyone. Uh, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Carrie Albert nine, takes 12, a quick head 13, count. 14, Her students 14, won't 14, be sitting 14, down 14, for long. 14, 14, 14. A lot of us are working on elder-focused projects that we're going to be using for our graduation. This isn't your typical classroom or school. Yeah. Within minutes, 25 kids are let loose into a place few would imagine a grade six class should be set free, an advanced care home. 11-year-old Megan Drabble is feeling pretty lucky. Hi, Inga. Her partner for the morning is 97-year-old Inga Gropi, a retired Sunday school teacher. I love the children. <laughs> she sort of makes each and every one of us feel like we're really special. The saying old people really doesn't define them. Um, because they're much more than an old person. They're, um, because they've lived longer, so they share a lot of wisdom. That wisdom is part of the curriculum. The program is called iGen, short for intergenerational. It all started with Carrie Albert. I remember saying to my brother, I would love to have a classroom where there were all ages of people. And he said, oh, good for you. Good luck with that. A bold idea, but with Albert's vision, the Saskatoon Public School Division placed a grade six class inside the Sherbrooke Community Centre. It has more than 250 residents, mostly seniors, some with dementia, and people with varying physical and intellectual abilities. Unlike other programs, students don't just visit once or twice a week to volunteer a few hours. They spend the entire school year in the care home the first of its kind in Canada. Well, we better let you get back to work then. As a young girl, Albert was inspired by her grandfather, who had multiple sclerosis. He and her grandmother worked hard to change perceptions and create opportunities for people with varying abilities. It shaped the way she sees the world, and she wanted to give that to her students. They see the human spirit. They see that if your body doesn't look like mine, that is okay. You are a human being and you have a right to a life that is abundant. And I, I absolutely see that happening in this program. Um, I get teary talking about it because it is, it is really the most powerful thing. Your picture's gonna go on to the graduation. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah. Isabella Dede is learning how to connect with Dean Tide. Looks pretty, Dean. Hello now, yeah. old 11. Yeah, 11. He's a biologist, but a brutal attack left him blind with an acquired brain injury. 
What do you enjoy about spending time with Isabella? Everything, everything. I want to try something new, and I want to make people happy. Good, good friends, good friends. Towards my voice, perfect. And while it may all sound nice and sweet, with an aging population in Canada, Deb Schick says it's actually a lifesaver. She's in charge of nursing and therapy at the care home. Loneliness is killing our seniors. This is a way to combat loneliness, is by bringing kids, bringing the generations together. Sherbrooke Community Centre subscribes to the philosophy that three plagues kill elders. Loneliness, boredom and helplessness. Jody Grant knows it all too well. A teacher for decades, she has a PhD in literacy. Dr. Grant taught at the University of Saskatchewan, then the University of West Indies in Jamaica. She was living the life of her dreams. I really had everything going at that point. I was so at peace. Then, 10 years ago, she was mangled in a horrific vehicle accident, a fractured spinal cord and excruciating pain. I was completely depressed. All I wanted to do really was die. And when the accident first happened, I kept telling my son, give me your glasses. Give me your glasses. What did you want to do? Oh, I was going to break them and use them to, to cut my jugular. You know, I just wanted to die. It was horrible. After two years in hospital, she moved into Sherbrooke Community Centre. And while the care was excellent, Grant had lost her purpose in life. It was completely boring. It was dead. You know what? You're here and I'm here. Yep. <laughs> and we're all here. But all Carrie around. Albert could see that Grant had a lot to offer the students. So she invited Grant to come teach and share her passion for reading with the children. Little more than a purr, flies flapping in a far off window pane. It gave me a reason to get up in the morning and an enthusiasm for life that I hadn't had. She never thought she'd be a teacher again, but here she is. Who gave up raiding ships to study bees. I think she is the most amazing person I've ever known, and I consider her one of the biggest mentors in my life, for sure. Hi. Hi. For Deb Schick, it's also become quite personal. She put her daughter Ava in the program this year to teach her empathy. I don't think it's an easy thing to do. Um, you know, you, you see kids today making fun, bullying, um, and that's, that's not okay. Okay, we're ready to go. But opening her daughter's heart has also exposed her to pain when residents die. It can be quite traumatic for them. They may not, not have ever had anyone pass away in their lives. And so this is sort of their first experience with death. It's very hard, but it's also very real. And one of the things that we talk, when we talk about IGEN, we talk about it being the school of real life. I see everything with new eyes. Ava and her friend Liv are taking it all in. You can love a stranger just by looking them in the eye. The kids will carry that with them as they go back to a traditional school. They're different people. I just look at them in wonder now. Some of these shy kids, I mean, who wouldn't look me in the eye, wouldn't get near me, who are coming up and giving me hugs. And five, six, seven, and five. This program is now so popular, the school division must use a lottery system to select students for next year. And come September, a new class, new friendships, new life lessons. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. Up next, Bob McDonald shines the light of science on everyday life. How your skin closes up over a cut and why your nose can't handle extremes. Time first, though, to check today's business numbers. The TSX fell slightly. The dollar increased two-tenths of a cent. In New York, the Dow gained nearly 15 points and the price of oil edged up 37 cents a barrel. The people of Thomasville, Georgia have stopped counting how often it comes. They just know it does. 
It's that train, the one carrying the most galling of cargoes. Canadian softwood lumber, Newfoundland, Quebec, British Columbia's best. Each plank more salt in the very deep wound of Bob Balfour. Well, it doesn't feel very good to see the tracks filled with Canadian lumber. We know it's overwhelming the country. In that rail yard shadow, three generations of Bob Balfours have cut southern pine here. But the mill's been silent for months. No match, the argument goes, for Canada. We know it's taking our markets away from us. They can undersell uh, southern yellow pine all over the United States. There's no way that we can compete with Canada. Here in the land of the southern pine, that's a little hard to take. Georgia is the largest lumber products manufacturer in the entire United States, but that doesn't mean its own southern pine rules this place. Canadian softwood, this lumber right here, now takes a third of the market. Ideal for the construction industry, Canadian softwood is lighter, easier to pound nails into, cheaper. And that's always frustrated the U.S. mill owners. Decades of trade battles were supposed to end with a deal negotiated in 1996 that restricts the export of Canadian softwood lumber. U.S. mill owners say it didn't protect them enough, point out that three major Georgia mills have closed in the last year. Many more, like Metcalf Lumber, are on the brink. Limping along, the owner says, in hope that when the current agreement ends on March 31st, something stricter will replace it. Canadians want just the opposite, complete free trade in softwood. That makes P.W. Bryant I shudder. I think the situation only worsens. Yeah, probably we'll, we'll have to shut down. Canadian mills are suffering too, but there's a perception here that Canada has an unbeatable edge partly because of the low Canadian dollar, partly because many Canadian mills are more modern, more efficient. But the most unfair advantage, say the Americans, is how little Canadians pay for timber. Where U.S. mills must bid for wood on the open market, Canadians buy it from government-owned land at much cheaper prices. An illegal subsidy, the Americans scream. Don't bother trying to remind anyone here that that's never been proven. I don't think they're as justified as our plight. I'm telling you, the lumber industry in the United States is in dire straits. I mean, they, this is the worst. I've been in it 40 years, I've never seen it like this. Complex trade issues that deep in the southern woods boil down to one clear reality. It's really hurt our business. You know, I don't have any problem with them shipping it in here, but they should tax it accordingly. an entire industry on the edge. Convinced Canada is driving it into oblivion. Adrian Arsenault, CBC News, Thomasville, Georgia. He's been making sense of science for us for 40 years. And every year, he takes your questions. And I love questions like this, where you look at something in everyday life and you say, you know, like, why is it like that? That's how science works. Questions like, what has science learned from those that have suffered a near-death experience? Want to know the answer? Well, we sat down with CBC's science correspondent and host of Quirks and Quarks, Bob McDonald, for a special two-part one-on-one. And tonight, here's a special preview. So let's get some answers. Round two for 2017. <laughs> and sadly, you know, kind of the last one for me. Yeah, and yeah. One-on-one. -on -one, uh, We've been doing this for how many years now? Uh, quite a few. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And uh, always so enjoyable to, uh, to do this with you. Okay. And I know people love it. I'm going to um, miss it, Peter. Here we go. First question for uh, the, this final session. Keith Nile from Toronto. There are stars that appear yellow, red, white, and even blue. Why aren't there any bright green stars? Now, I'll be honest. I, uh, I don't know. It must be my eyes. I can never, t 
I never saw all, all I ever see is white stars. Is that right? Yeah. Oh well, in the winter time, if you uh, if you look at the famous constellation Orion, it's the big square with the three in the middle. Uh, there's a, there's a star up on its shoulder called Betelgeuse. It's definitely red if you look at it. And then down by his feet, there's the dog this star is, is this Sirius. With the naked eye, or yep, 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 be, yep, yeah. yep. With okay. naked eye, you'll see it's got an orange tint to it. And then Sirius, the dog star, down by its feet is is blue white. And those are two different kinds of stars. Stars are all basically made of the same stuff. They're made of hydrogen and helium, but they're different temperatures. So if you see a red star, it's cool. The temperature on the surface only about 2,500 degrees. <laughs> it's still pretty hot by our standards, yeah. but, but that's cool. Our sun is uh, called the yellow star, so it's about 6,000 degrees. It's hotter. And then the, the blue stars, they're getting up around 15,000. And then you get into really hot white stars, and there are actually green stars, and they're 50,000 degrees. They can be up to 50,000 degrees on the surface. We don't see very many of them because they live fast and die young. Mm. <laughs> they don't last long. They just burn themselves out. Only so, the good ones do that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, re there were more green stars at the beginning, but uh, not too many now. When we do see them, they don't last very long, but they do exist. All right, video from Catherine Burr from London, Ontario. If I cut or scrape my skin, what is the process the body uses to heal itself and repair? Uh, how did the two sides of the cut come together so the cut disappears? And uh, if I put a Band-Aid on it, will it heal faster? This, this is a fascinating process. There's actually four stages involved in this. So there are these specialized skin cells that go to the site of the wound and they start to populate either side of it. And they just grow like crazy. They just grow like mad. And as they, they reach out to each other across the room, they touch and they produce collagen. So collagen is in your skin. It's what gives your skin its strength. It's what you lose when you get really old and your skin starts hanging on your face. You know, it looks really thin. That's loss of collagen. So they make collagen, and collagen is very fibrous. And these fibers reach out to each other, and they hook like this, and then they shrink, and they actually draw together like this. And they draw the sides of the wound together. And then they fill in that space. And then they cover it over with another layer on top. So there are four stages to populate, get the collagen, pull it together, and, and heal over the top. The thing is that when it's done, these skin cells are not like regular skin cells. They don't have pigment, so they don't turn dark, and they don't have hair. So you got to be really careful with your scars in the sun. I don't know if you, if you have a scar and you, you get a sunburn, the scar will stay pink. And so they're, they're more susceptible. But it's an incredible process of our skin healing itself. That probably explains the scars on my head. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> <laughs> um, what about the tape? What about oh, if you oh, use yes. a Band-Aid? Well, the Band-Aid is mostly to keep germs out. Uh, is, is to keep bacteria and everything out from the outside. That's, that's mostly what it is, is keep the dirt out. It doesn't really speed the healing. In fact, oftentimes it's better to leave it open if you're in a clean environment. So. Stitching. It, Stitching it, is bringing the wound together so there's less, so that the cells have farther to, to reach, right? It's just trying to close the wound to let those healing cells get in contact with you and draw that collagen together. So it's an aid to the cells. Yep. Jim Miller from Richmond, BC. Uh, has this question uh, on video. What has science learned from those that have suffered a near-death experience? Perhaps it's something to do with memory storage and replay, or possibly even something from the realm of spirituality? Well, I can answer this question from a personal point of view because uh, earlier this year, uh, my brother, who's extremely physically fit, he was on a bicycle uh, race, a long ride to, to raise funds, and he had a heart attack and he died on the side of the road and they brought him back thanks to paramedics that were there on the scene but his heart had stopped for many minutes and they had to put him into a cold coma for a while before he could come back to consciousness what, what does that mean um, they lowered the temperature of the body to uh, to allow to give the heart a rest so they actually cooled him down they're so he doing was in that a right coma. on the side of the road or? no they did it in the hospital oh. once they got him to the hospital right and it took him months to recover from that uh, he's back, he's great. You know, he's back on his bicycle again. But I went to see him while he was there and he was totally out of it. Um, and even when he started coming back into consciousness, I was talking to him, I thought he was responding. I've talked to him since about that. I said, so what do you remember? What do you remember? He says, all I remember is riding along and then there were these two girls riding in front of me and they were going really fast. And I would say, why are they going so fast? I'm usually passing them. But he was slowing down. And he said, and all I remember was just kind of nodding my head and that's it, he has no recollection of the event. He has no going to the light experience, um, and his, his short-term memory around that was affected, but his long-term memory is not, and he's back. So it didn't change his spirituality, but what it did change is his appreciation for life. 
Mm. He loves life and he has no tolerance for people who complain. So there's a case of someone who sort of died and come back. And when he left the hospital, they, they said, welcome back. They didn't say goodbye. They said, welcome back. So I, you know, uh, it's His hard appreciation to say. for first yeah, responders too. Absolutely. Gone absolutely. How absolutely. long? How long was he out? I mean, if they got it, they had to take him to a hospital. We're, yeah. We're well, they, it took a while. Fortunately, there were other paramedics that had the paddles on their oh, okay. bicycles. So there, there are right. paramedics that ride with him. The so the first one yeah. to to get there, he right. was on him right away with the CPR. Actually, right. broke a couple of ribs to try to keep the heart going, right. and then they get the paddles on to try to stabilize the heart because the heart fibrillates like this, yeah. and um, and then they get it stabilized. But he was. Um, Good 15 don't, minutes people don't realize like how hard you have to yeah. push. Yeah. Like yeah. breaking ribs is. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to intentionally break ribs, but yeah. it's uh, you know it, to, to keep it, it going. You got to push hard. Do that. Um, great news that he's uh, back yeah, and with he's back. us. Okay. Anna Lane of uh, Ottawa. My nose runs when the weather is cold. It also runs when I eat hot food. Why are my sinuses so affected by both extremes? of temperatures. Yeah, well, we sneeze because of irritants in that get into our nose, whether it's dust or pollen or whatever. And it's the body saying, look, I, I don't want this. The nose is a filter. That's why it's got mucus in it to stop stuff from getting into our lungs and into our, our nasal passage. So if there's something there that irritates it, you sneeze to get it out. Just get it out. And it's, it's you know, you use more muscles. You use almost every muscle in your body to sneeze. There's only one other activity that we do that uses more muscles. And so you, we, we try to get. You're not going to explain what that is. Sex. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and Just orgasm. wanted to hear you say that. <laughs> and, and, this is our last show, right? <laughs> yeah. So, but you use everything. Your body wants everything to get get rid of that. Well, it turns out that cold is also an irritant. Cold air is an irritant to your nose because it it's, it feels funny when it goes in, and so can heat. So it's just your body responding the same way as it would to pollen. An irritant in your nose to you want to get rid of. We don't like to be cold. <laughs> That's our time. Wow. Been another uh, great one. I'll, I'll miss these uh, for a lot yeah. of reasons, but I learned so much from them, and I know our viewers do too. And yeah. I may be going, but Bob's not. So well, well I, I got to tell one. you, Peter, it's been a real pleasure doing these with you. It's fun, yeah. and I should mention we don't rehearse these. Okay, no. there's, there's no <laughs> rehearsal, and we don't rehearse on the national either. We just no. throw those straight up, and it's yeah. just it's just such a joy working with you. You listen, you feedback, yeah. and it's just been great. And I'm going to be miss you. totally transparent. You, you do get a sense of what the questions are, yeah, yeah, of course, sure. so you can. Yeah. Do a little bit of research, um, and uh, but it's oh, very natural between no, no uh, between you and I. <laughs> Thanks again, Peter. It's been great. Thanks. Great. Reform's chief of policy, Steve Harper, previews a major theme of the weekend. Reformers want a strong country built by those who want in, not by those who want out. I guess in terms of the results in Calgary West tonight, there's only one thing I can say along the lines of what Don Cherry always says, and that's... <laughs> 48,561, which is 55.04%. This country needs a party dedicated not to worshipping or taking advantage of the system, but to reforming the system in this country to better serve the interests of ordinary, hard-working, common-sense Canadians. Good evening. Stephen Harper and Peter McKay were all smiles and handshakes today as they took the wraps off their historic deal to merge the Progressive Conservatives and the Canadian Alliance. This division of Conservatives is ending. Our swords will henceforth be pointed at the Liberals, not at each other. In the end, the campaign's frontrunner, the former leader of the Canadian Alliance, won the leadership on the first round of voting, denying Belinda Stronach and Tony Clement a second round to try to overtake him. The tired, old and corrupt Liberal Party is right now cornered like an angry rat. We are saying it is going to be a Conservative minority government. You're looking at the 22nd Prime Minister of Canada. Friends, I have never been so proud of our great country and I am honoured and overwhelmed to be asked to lead it. Most hours have 60 minutes. This hour has seven days.
Tonight, Ralph Nader charges the Detroit car companies with running risks that can't hurt them, but do hurt us. I could give an example of the Buick Roadmaster in 1953. The one with power brakes came onto the market, many thousands of them, with a defective braking system. Now, you mean in, in the 53 Buick Roadmaster, with power a driver brakes. would literally go from normal brakes to no brakes like that's that? Right, that's right. This is documented in court records, which is very interesting. It shows you that the only way we find out about this thing is through the cumbrous process of the judicial uh, uh, system. So what you want to do is make an overwhelming systematic case to overcome the resistance of industry. The stronger a case you make, the more scientists you have uh, working on the project uh, on an independent, objective basis, the more overpowering the forces of humane automotive technology will be. Greetings, greetings. <laughs> Bizarre and unpredictable, Sur surrealist painter Salvador Dali had no known children. But nearly 30 years after his death, a judge has ordered Dali's body exhumed to settle a paternity suit with DNA. A Spanish woman claims she's the result of Dali's affair with her mother in the 1950s. If true, she could inherit millions. It's one of the most common and bitter complaints of our time the high price of tickets to concerts, stage plays, or the big game. Thanks to predatory ticket scalpers and online resellers, Canadians have had it with astronomical markups, if they can even get tickets at all. But as Jacqueline Hansen reports, at least one province has plans to fight back. U2 headlined in Toronto on the weekend and made news again this morning over its hot selling tickets. Tickets on the floor, which originally sold for $70, were listed on resale sites for three or four times than the original price. That was not fair. The changes proposed today would try to prevent that in the future for high demand games and concerts. The province wants to cap resale markups at 50% above face value, force sellers to disclose how many tickets are open to the general public, and ban ticket bots, software that mimics humans to buy large blocks of tickets fast. Last summer, bots were slammed for shutting fans out of tickets to the Tragically Hips tour. More and more performers and artists are taking it into their own hands to stop them. Hey, I'm gonna wear a fake mustache. Comedian Louis C.K. sells his tickets on his own website in an attempt to control who buys them and to keep the bots out. For my own record, yeah. Earlier this year, Eric Church cancelled 25,000 tickets scooped up by bots. But to ban a technology that can hop borders will be a challenge. There's a lot of ticket resellers that are not based in the province, so how are you going to force them to abide by our rules? Music publicist Eric Alper is also skeptical of the resale cap. Capping it at 50% higher than the ticket price will only make scalpers work twice as hard in order to keep their profit margin. While it's unclear how the province would fully enforce the rules, if they're broken, fans and businesses could sue, and the rule breakers would face hefty fines. But experts say all of that may still not make it easier for fans to get their hands on tickets, because for the big games and the hottest shows, demand always outstrips supply. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Tickets to the Stanley Cup final or an Olympic gold medal game are always hard to come by, but players in this next group have been there and won. Now they have another thing in common. Today, they were all named as this year's inductees into the Hockey Hall of Fame. The Finnish Flash, Timu Solani, set an NHL record for the most goals scored by a rookie with the original Winnipeg Jets. His 21-year career included a Stanley Cup win with Anaheim in 2007. One of Solani's longtime teammates, Paul Correa, also got the nod today. The North Vancouver native was named an All-Star seven times and won Olympic gold in 2002. Hamilton's Dave Andrichuk, who holds the record for most power play goals in NHL history, is in. He led the Tampa Bay Lightning to the Stanley Cup in 
2004. Mark Recchi from Kamloops, BC will be a Hall of Famer. He won the cup with the Penguins, Hurricanes, and Bruins. And how's this for a record? Two Olympic gold medals, eight world championships. Quebec's Danielle Goyet caps the inductees. That's the National this Monday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Peter Mansbridge. Thanks for watching.